fight. A society of spectacle. What is it? Or what was it? These four categories we got. News, entertainment, advertising, propaganda. But then there's social media. And I debated whether, is this a separate spectacle category? Something like a micro diffuse spectacle? But in my opinion, this is merely a difference in degree rather than a difference in kind. The secondary reality in which everything was a choice between 20 channels is now a choice between 2 million channels, including this one. So we know the spectacle needs reality and reality needs the spectacle. The spectacle drowns out reality. Power conspires for itself to be hidden. And there's a loss here. We've lost something. And in spectacle theory, we've lost the social. But we could get it back if we try really, really hard. If we're very, very radical in our commitments and beliefs. In that previous video, I labeled it as a neo-Marxist. But there is a specter haunting the spectacle. What if we could only not get the social back? But what if the social never existed in the first place? <laughs> That's to say its theoretical inception was always an after the fact explanation from the jump. That's gonna be Baudrillard's strategy. We'll never get back to the real social because it was never really there. It's an explanation that arrives too late after the fact and doesn't actually explain the thing that you hope it does. So trying to represent reality in theoretical systems, whether that's writing books or making videos, is trying to escape a system by adding to it. Does that make sense? It's like communicating in order to get outside of communication. And that's just impossible. And maybe, maybe this is a better way to put it. The spectacle theory assumes that if we communicated about reality better, if we communicated more about the real relations of production, if we wrote more books and made more YouTube videos and then did more public art, then the people would wake up. They'd become conscious. No says Baudrillard. The problem is not that we don't communicate enough or well enough, it's that we communicate, communicate, communicate way too much already. That medium is the message thing and the medium itself is antisocial. So sending out more messages is not gonna wake people up out of their ideological dream, it merely adds to the complexity of the dream. So if you do get the feeling correctly that social media feels antisocial, then you might be feeling the same thing he did, although he said it way back in the 80s, that time that we look back on as a nostalgic time of neighborhood bike rides and in-person board games. So the way out of the spectacle is supposed to be more radical production of theory, of situations and art. And here's my response to myself with the benefit of hindsight. You can overproduce as frantically as you want you can make all the Marxist YouTube videos you want, but in the end, you're just gonna be doing the same shit as everyone else. Nothing escapes spectacularization, even protests, and most demonstrably, art. In the age of uh, ancient Rome and, and Greece, the idea of these mythical gods um, having magical powers, having the ability to, to cheat death and live into the afterlife, um, alter the world around us, having a very similar relationship um, with characters like Mewtwo. Now Baudrillard had the same mentor as Debord, Henri Lefebvre, which is cool. Though he became less and less convinced by the Marxist or neo-Marxist view of the world, especially history. And if you want a word for what he's doing around the 80s, maybe, maybe call it post-Marxism. So the quick review is that for De Boer, there's an economic base where the real stuff in society happens, especially commodity ownership, production, and also like power. And then there's a spectacle, and the spectacle is not truly productive, it's pseudo-productive. <laughs> energy sucking choices and fake conflicts, that's spectacle. Images by which we relate to each other that make no difference to the conditions of life. And then between the base 
and the spectacle are all the people that constitute society. They're all in between. And the spectacle is over here. They're looking this way instead of this way. And they are atomized, alienated in private shells. Why? Because they're ignorant and stupid. <laughs> so to be conscious is to look this way, to see the truth of the structure, a truth that is in the last instance, at least economic relations. So this is what good intellectuals are supposed to do. They wake people up. They give them consciousness. They make them aware of what's really going on. The relations of production are still awaiting some social subjects to wake up and move history forward. Now, this is an extremely tense moment. We have our little model. We have all of our people with wills. They have the manpower required to change society. And at long last, are they going to look the right way? What will happen? What are they going to do? Look around. No one's waking up. Oh shit. Now they're all falling into fascism. Oh God. Oh shit. Why? If theory is supposed to do anything, it needs to figure out why this step doesn't go as planned. Believing in the consciousness of the masses as inevitable or even possible might just be another layer of enlightenment fantasy that humanists are trying to sneak into the model. Of course, consciousness is probably there because it makes theorists feel like they're really important to this process when in fact, the whole model is wrong. And why would that be? It's wrong because it holds that society, the direction of a society, the history of a society is ultimately a matter of decision. If not an actual choice that has been made, then at least a potential choice that we can theorize about making or having been made a virtual choice. To be unconscious for De Boer is at least the kind of implied choice that the subjects of a society make. They want to continue being unconscious because they're ignorant. They're, be they're beholden to the little uh, pleasures of the spectacle. And so they choose to make fake choices instead of the real choices. So if we ask Baudrillard his opinion on the matter, if we look around a bit, you know, we have maybe 10,000 years of cultures, and not many of them were really that concerned with this fantastic event of the choice. Is that because they were all stupid and ignorant? Or is it more accurate to say that choices more often choose them? And they were a lot more concerned with rituals and simulacra and images than the rather boring question of who owns what. In fact, when it comes to that question, they're not really ignorant at all. People usually know exactly who owns what and don't care. And as often as not, they end up worshiping those owners. And the reason they do that, a Marxist may theorize, is that they are all beholden to ideology or false consciousness. And I should specify, this is not all Marxists, just the representationalist ones or the humanist ones, like De Boer. He still hopes that society is at bottom a matter of freedom, a social contract. And because of that damned spectacle, we the people choose not to be free. So Baudrillard asks instead, what if we aren't trapped by ideology? What if they are actually, and we are actually, getting exactly what we want from the TVs and the TikToks, whether that's consuming football or consuming educational content on YouTube? What if it's the theorists who are alienated from the masses? Theorists who give all these explanations for our behavior after the fact, without understanding us at all. What if deep down, we really don't want the burden of anything like freedom? Big if true. So here, I guess, is like the, the summary overview. The spectacle theory, whatever it's good for, and it's good for a lot, it's fun but it's cooking with the wrong ingredients insofar as consciousness and freedom are part of the explanatory recipe. Because Baudrillard's post-Marxism isn't dumping all of Marxism. He wants to test out some alternative hypotheses, like whatever event of consciousness you're supposing could happen, 
It's not happening. It's never happened. And it's not not happening because everyone is stupid and watches Fox News instead of reading uh, the Communist Manifesto. And this is for sure true that consciousness is a really terrible as a supposed reactant in revolutions. You know what's a good necessary cause? Starvation. This goes out to anyone who has ever typed the words overthrow capitalism into their phone or computer, okay? Has there ever been a revolution without starvation? Because when they're fed, the masses don't do anything unexpected. So instead of just taking the route of calling them stupid or saying they're all deceived, Baudrillard is not interested in calling them subjects at all. Let's not even call them objects. Let's just group them as a giant aggregate mass object. Now, individuals might have inconsequential disagreements with each other, but the mass as a whole exists to keep everything in politics moving in the same direction. Definitely not to change direction. And the only time the masses ever wake up to change direction is when they're starving. This might be controversial. I don't know. It doesn't seem like that to me. There has never in history been a revolution caused by ideas, no matter what the high school history textbooks say. So the first step is let's just drop consciousness from the social. That doesn't explain shit about people, en masse at least. And while we're at it, why don't we just drop the social from society too. It's redundant. The social as a special property is something like a, a, a magical connection that theorists put on to people after the fact that sneaks in the hidden assumption that we actually enjoy the burden of choice. You heard about the social contract? Big news. No one ever signed that. You know that, right? It's made up. Almost all social theory forever believes in that one central illusion that society is composed of subjects. The better explanation is that there are no subjects in society. And I know this claim will be very offensive to some, but this is not just some whacked out postmodernist bullshit. Louis Althusser said pretty much the same thing. And he's a Marxist, not a postmodernist. Uh, systems theory also not postmodernist, says more or less the same thing. So contrary to De Boer and contrary to humanist Marxism, is that the spectacle or the media of the spectacle have at long last revealed the truth. The vast screen of the spectacle has finally shown what was always the case. There is no hidden meaning. For example, uh, Spectacular politics. Called the N-word because of Taylor Swift. Attacks on the United States. Playing the game live right now on television. The left has been mugged by reality and continues to be mugged by reality. I am an enormous old Disney fan. Head to head. Little Marco, Lion Ted, low energy Jeb. Uh, he's a human chainsaw. You are a rude, terrible person. Spectacular politics shows what politics has always been. Since, I don't know, forever. Politics is pretty much everyone that has a non-committal, low effort agreement that some guy who sounds like he's got a plan should run things. That guy might be the son of God or ordained by God or a successful businessman, but the mass just wants someone to take care of that stuff. Reality doesn't matter to anyone as long as someone's just there. Now philosophy or like political philosophy tried to come around and say, no, politics is actually about freedom or the general will or a magical world process of self-consciousness. Oh, and that stuff has really always been the original cause. Oh, writing the cause after the fact. Now, someone like Trump's not dangerous because he did or will do anything really worse than any other president. He's dangerous to the system because he's obscene. Now, the scene of politics is an invention by political philosopher types. The scene is supposed to be this proper, dignified drama of two competent, intelligent men or women 
selected to debate over the future of society. And then the respectable uh, newspaper columnists give their evaluations. And then finally, reasonable people everywhere go and make their informed decision. That's our scene. The obscene shows that that whole process is a big theatrical production. It's a show. Politics is not and never was some rational, dignified process. It's better and probably more accurate to, to think of it as which hairless ape can seduce enough of the energies of this big blob of people that doesn't really care that much to be involved, especially if it takes any effort. And I guess the novel point here is that this isn't news. You're dishonest people. Because it's always been like that. And nothing that Aristotle or Locke or Kant wrote changed any of that. At best, they just changed the props on the stage here and there. The spectacle is not hiding anything, actually. It's making everything transparent, putting everything out there. I'm thinking, I'm thinking this might be a little bit hard to swallow. So another example, how about relationships and love and sex? The spectacle also shows those for what they always were, a scene. Well, I have an idea that I think will make us both feel much better. Okay. And that is if we each hold one of my nips. Okay. These nips. <laughs> <laughs> a stage for a game. Champagne and killer just going at it in the ring. A bunch of codified language and expressions and expectations. Progressed, mm -hmm. you know, like every week. Yeah. It's been like a new step and a new jump and just getting stronger and stronger. It culminates with a hot, fleshy exchange of liquid between uh, bipedal mammals. Okay. Um, there's something wrong with my kitchen sink. I think there's some sort of blockage. Do you think you can maybe take a look at my pipes? Also, relevant, this was my first uh, ever video on YouTube. It's not good and I don't recommend it, but it, it happened. What's supposed to be hidden about relationships and love and all these centuries of bullshit about marriage as sacred and weird gift exchanges and ceremonies, and then this idea of love as pure self-sacrifice that's apotheosized in romantic poetry and sometimes even given like the status of cosmic reality, love. And now we're freed from believing in that. We can't believe in it anymore because we see everything. Obscene relationships, obscene sex. On the screen of the spectacle, nothing's hidden and the scene becomes the obscene. So everything's visible on the surface. It's transparent. There's no more hidden depths. And The Bachelor, is more correct about love than some uh, Petrarchian sonnet. When love within her lovely face appears now and again among the other ladies, as much as each is less lovely than she, the more my wish and love within me grows. Nah. You know the woman that he wrote about he probably never met and he just like stalked the shit out of her? <laughs> so reality TV, on the other hand, is obscene. It's more real than real, and certainly more real than this. And what a relief this is, really. Like what, what egos would we need to have to think that we are meant to play in the playground of cosmic metaphysical games, freedom unto itself, love, God, and all the other main concerns of the philosophers. And so, Love it or hate it, this is how Baudrillard wants to do theory. The spectacle doesn't conceal what we actually deep down care about, but we're too unconscious to recognize, you know, our powerless economic status. The screen of the spectacle demonstrates patently what we really care about, which is about just a bunch of superficial sign exchanges because we are a mass of hooting, howling, bored, lazy, drama-hungry apes. And we want to be seduced. And you know, I'm laying a lot at the feet of DeBoer here, but it's not really DeBoer's fault for believing maybe we could do better. The fault lies with the whole discipline of philosophy, because since the start, it's repeated a lot of these metaphysical assumptions about history and reality somehow being rational deep down. 
Even though it might not look rational on the surface, if you become a theologian or you become a philosopher, then you can see the rational patterns that no one else sees. The true dignity of man. But now that we have the gift of the spectacle, that scene too is shown for what it is, theater. <laughs> There's no meaning, deep meaning to history that we're responsible for or that we have to go find. The spectacle is an evil genie that we cannot put back into the lamp. Some might see this as depressing. Is that depressing to you? Others might find it to be relieving. And don't worry, there's like still, there's still games to play. They're just going to be uh, different games. Obscenity begins when there is no more spectacle, no more stage, no more theater, no more illusion. When everything becomes immediately transparent, visible, exposed in the raw and inexorable light of information and communication. So the spectacle, as it was posited, was a false world that was hiding a real one but the spread of this false world into the real one had an unintended consequence that's that it destroyed the distinction between the false one and the real one so now there's neither true nor false there is just information true and false are both messages of the same medium the message of tv is quite independent of the program the effect of the program is incidental Truth is not anymore some cosmic law. It's now a fiber optic buzz. Wait, does fiber optics buzz? I think they probably don't. Shit. You know, you know what I mean. My example of the spectacle is that it's this, this iron suit in which you are a happy prisoner. But the end of the spectacle is when this suit still flies around, but there's no person inside it anymore. Oh, I'm not here. Thank God this place has Wi-Fi or you would be toast right now. Think about it. Why do we even need Tony Stark? The suit does all the work anyway. People will be all like with their theories or the algorithms are making us dumb. They're dividing us. They're spreading misinformation. And what if we on mass really just want to be dumb? We really want to be a part of a group that is different from another group and hates them. And also to have our incorrect biases confirmed as correct. Maybe that's what society is, and maybe that's all society has ever been. Here you go, I, I love this quotation. The masses know that they know nothing and they have no desire to know. The masses know they are powerless and they don't want power. We reproach them vigorously for these signs of stupidity and passivity, but they're not that at all. The masses are very snobbish and sovereignly delegate the faculty of choice to someone else in a sort of game of irresponsibility. So but, but the people that are supporting me in particular, they're very smart people. People are not dumb. They're lazy and smart enough to stay lazy. Their privilege is that politicians are going to run around and do busy work and inevitably fail. And then the masses have someone to get mad at while they just get to sit there and chill. It's an Oedipal thing. We need successful people to look at so that we can, you know, take pleasure in their failures. So this is what he's getting at when he says it's better to just drop our model of politics without any human beings in it. And now wait, I know there's going to be a hundred objections to this. You're going to say, I'm a human being. What about me? I'm in society. So this postmodern theory crap is just clearly false. But this is a line in Marxism too. I'd argue from late Marx to Althusser. There are no human beings in society should be read as a historical claim because human being is a really loaded term. It doesn't just mean like, a body or a biological homo sapien. It means a lot of theoretical attachments that have always been also part of what it means to be human. Like sapiens, intelligent, homo liber, free, homo economicus, politicus, intelligent, free, economic, political. Something's always added to the human and then used as an explanation for the other term, society. So society still needs an explanation. 
And there are thousands of theories about that. And almost all of them put human plus something else as the building block of society. The human plus intelligence, the human plus sociability, the human plus politics. But then you're already assuming in the human plus the thing that you're trying to explain, society. But you can't just assume that, look, it's right in the title. The idea here and the idea of the society of the spectacle is that it's human plus communications media. De Boer was sad that we are missing the human because the humans are unconscious in the spectacle and they're just alienated consumers, fine. But the next theoretical step here is to just say, the individual doesn't really make any difference to society anyway, and never did. That's a kind of stupid cornerstone to build political theory on. Society is communication events and not even specifically uh, human communication events. It's radio and TV broadcasts, it's digital broadcast events. There's no need for sociability, politics, intelligence, or economic self-interest that we are supposed to be bringing to the table. I mean, like, we don't even communicate with each other. Our phones communicate to each other in our place. It's our Iron Man suits that communicate, and we don't even need to be inside them anymore. It's just too much work. So theoretically, why not cut out the middleman? The main development in the, uh, these electric media is the loss of private identity. Mass man means man as related to all other men simultaneously. The masses destroy and eclipse the individual. But perhaps, for the individual, they represent the long dreamed of chance to disappear. And again, please don't get me wrong and take the wrong thing away from this. This is not to say that we don't exist, but rather that we don't exist as individual subjectivities carrying out the present and carrying out the future of society. We act as a mass, the mass of mass media. And the mass is an object, not a subject. The mass was once supposed to be the proletariat. They were supposed to be the subject of history. But with this illusion dispelled, we can theorize clearer than before. The mass is an object, not a group of subjects. The mass by definition, resists changing history. And you know what, this, this injunction, this, this goal of changing history puts a lot of weight on your shoulders, doesn't it? What if it weren't possible? Wouldn't that be freer? Then we have to get to all the objections about quote unquote postmodernism. Because another question you could ask here is, what are the stakes? This sounds like postmodernism, which some just define as the philosophy that nothing matters. Baudrillard does, though, think stuff matters. And the reason is that mass media produces hyperconformism that is the pure mass, that mass pulling everything into it. De Boer, despite what he hopes is not awakening the masses, he's producing more hyperconformism, doing a performative revolution. To choose the wrong strategy is a serious matter. All the movements that only play on liberation, emancipation, on the resurrection of a subject of real history, of the group, of the word based on consciousness raising, indeed, the raising of the unconscious, of subjects and of the masses, do not see that they are going in the direction of the system, whose imperative today is precisely the overproduction and regeneration of meaning and of speech. That is to say, you're not gonna solve the problem of freedom with yet another book. Overproduction is a bad strategy. And overproducing meaning is the strategy of metaphysicians, pretending that it's hidden out there somewhere, hidden in books that were just too dumb to read properly. No, you see, meaning is on the surface. It is the surface. To overproduce the burden of meaning merely perpetuates the logic of the system and keeps it going exactly the way that it's going. That strategy wants you to continually look for depth where there isn't any to find anymore. No, the fatal strategy, the strategy of defiance is to remain entirely on the surface, among appearances, 
which he notes, most cultures have done and gotten by just fine in so doing. Basically, our problem is we still believe too much and then feel bad for not doing enough about it. Don't hear that very often, do ya? The strategy of theory should be a little more playful or artful, a little less self-assured, and maybe a little more fatal. Now we've said a whole lot about what theory can't do or what it thinks it's doing and how it's wrong. But what theory can do is to defy the world to be more, more objective, more ironic, more seductive, more real or more unreal. The distance theory takes is not that of retreat, but that of exorcism. You could say he wants theory to take itself less seriously, to reflect a world out there that doesn't take itself very seriously to begin with. Yeah, one of his chapters, last chapter, is just called Why Theory? And despite Baudrillard usually being dismissed for being obscure or nihilistic or trolling, it's not unclear what he thinks theory is for, dismantling these ancient illusions. It's just that he means that in the opposite way that most philosophers, psychoanalysts, or Marxists like de Boer do, which is usually escape the cave, escape ideology, get back to the real world, and true consciousness. Whereas his version of escaping the illusion is to take the object's side, to take the world's side against subjects. The world and history is already in the process of dismantling this grand illusion of the real real. So to help in the dismantling of the illusion is not more moral or more correct, because who knows what those things mean anymore. In the end, it's actually just less boring. Yeah, so kind of long, but th that's it for this one. There's no prescriptions, no calls to action, no potential futures of restored meaning and grand possibilities, none of that shit. You don't have to feel bad for anything because none of the meaning in the universe or the direction of history is within your agency to control or change anyway. Whew, relief. You know, I do hate when people dismiss Baudrillard as just a nihilist. Now, nihilist, he said, I'm a nihilist. But it's not to just not believe in anything. He just doesn't want to hold illusions sacred anymore, especially because philosophers since Socrates seem only to be happy when they are sad and when everyone else is also sad. See, we theorists always have had a sad vision of the masses, alienated, a sad vision of the unconscious, repressed. Upon our entire philosophy lies the heavy weight of these sad correlations. If only for the sake of change, it would be interesting to conceive of the masses, the object masses, as possessing a delusive, elusive, allusive strategy, corresponding to an unconscious that is finally ironic, joyous, and seductive. So yeah, he doesn't argue this way appealing to its correctness or logically deduced. He just says, for the sake of change, this would be a more interesting conception. And I'm down. What if we, from here on out, rated philosophers on their interestingness? Evaluation on the level of aesthetics rather than a depth, when that depth is ultimately illusory. All right, there we go. I hope you found this interesting. Also, as always, thank you to this society, because you are definitely real subjects freely allowing me the privilege of presenting ideas to the public mass. The public is a non-agentic blob, but you are all true producers of history. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for supporting me. It's fun. <laughs>